RNA is an informational molecule. If one would want a simple um, analogy for it, you might use the analogy of a videotape. It's, it has a linear array of information, uh, which by itself uh, is typically thought of not doing anything, just like a, a VCR tape doesn't do anything unless you have a machine to put it into and a monitor to, to look at the image. But it's the storehouse of the information. It can, the bits of information are called nucleotides, and they're chemically uh, almost identical to the four bits of information that make up the DNA um, double helix. Instead of A, G, C, and T, the abbreviations are A, G, C, and U, where in fact U is just a slight chemical uh, derivative of, of, of T, or those of us who believe in the RNA world like to think of you know, DNA as being just a modified RNA molecule, so then you would say T, thymine is just a derivative of uracil, which is the which is the RNA base. But um, the other distinction between DNA and RNA uh, is, as you would guess from the term deoxyribose nucleic acid, that there is a missing oxygen in DNA. So RNA has, has an extra oxygen atom on each of the sugars of the repeating units. Uh, finally, the DNA is a double helix, as every school kid knows. Uh, and uh, but if you think about it, each strand has all of the information. The other strand is simply um, a, a complement of it. I always point out to my students, it's a complement with an E, not with an I. It's not like one strand saying, you know, you're looking very good today or something like that. But anyway, there are two complementary strands in the sense that they fit together, uh, it, whereas the RNA is just a single chain. However, that is important. And you say, why is that so important? Well, because when the nucleic acid is relieved of the constraint of being sort of lockstep with another strand in a double helix. It's free to take on all kinds of shapes because it can interact with other parts of itself. So the structures that RNA can achieve have a wonderful variety, more on the order of what a polypeptide or a protein molecule can achieve. And this is what allows RNA to be a biocatalyst rather than simply an informational molecule. I don't really consider this to be a, um, a, a trashing of the central dogma of molecular biology or a, it's really more just an elaboration because after all the central dogma uh, as described by Francis Crick is that DNA makes, RNA makes protein and that's still true. We didn't disprove that. We just found that protein isn't the only player in terms of cellular molecules that's able to speed up very specific biological reactions. That the, the middle guy in that stream, in, in the DNA makes RNA makes protein string, also can have the activity of being able to speed up biological reactions. So it was really a broadening of, of the definition of, of, a, of a biological catalyst uh, all enzymes are not, are not proteins. I was never interested in RNA. I, I knew very little about it, um, would occasionally belittle people in uh, neighboring research groups who were working on RNA saying, why don't you work on something really interesting like DNA? And all of my research was um, directed towards understanding chromosomes, understanding genes, DNA, um, may be interested in RNA only as far as it was the product of the expression of a gene, but not uh, uh, thereafter. So RNA really came looking for us, I think, more than we came looking for RNA. Uh, it was really in the course of mapping the uh, RNAs that were produced by a particular gene that I started working on when I set up my first independent research lab at the University of Colorado at Boulder, 1978. Started working on uh, this tetrahymena, it's a ciliated protozoan, a pond animal, tetrahymena gene that was repeated, uh, amplified 10,000 times per cell, so it provided a lot of, of the same gene doing the same thing at the same time. I thought it would be a good system for analysis. And when we looked at where the 
RNAs were produced from this gene, we found uh, that there was an uh, intervening sequence or an intron uh, interrupting the coding region. These were pretty new in biology. They had been discovered by Phil Sharp at MIT and a group at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory only a couple of years before. There were already, um, as things often explode in molecular biology, there were already more than 100 published examples in just that short couple of years. But no one knew very much about the process by which uh, they were removed from the copy, from the RNA copy of the, of the genetic material. So that was when I started being intrigued by ribonucleic acid as opposed to its uh, oxygen-lacking counterpart DNA. When we first got the copying of the DNA into RNA, the tra what's called transcription, occurring in the test tube outside of the cell, we noticed that in addition to the gene being copied into RNA, that the RNA was undergoing splicing. Now this was, so the splicing being the cutting and rejoining reaction that removes or pops out the intron and produces the mature functional form of the RNA. This reaction occurs with uh, very high fidelity, very precise positions along the RNA that are cut and rejoined. It occurs very quickly, therefore there must be an enzyme involved. It was, you could read in any biology textbook that all enzymes are proteins. So of course, we searched for the protein enzyme that was responsible. And this was a very crude cellular extract, and so the protein must be in there because after all, the RNA is undergoing splicing uh, in this crude mixture of cellular components. As we purified the, what we thought would be the substrate for this reaction, the thing, substrate being the, the thing acted upon, away from the rest of the cellular um, ingredients, the reaction continued. The RNA continued to be able to undergo splicing. So the hypothesis then was that this splicing enzyme, this protein, must be tightly associated with the RNA itself. Well, how convenient. It's coming along for the rye. You know, what a wonderful purification. Small problem, though. The attempt to prove that there was a protein attached um, would seem to be straightforward. One can, for example, treat the uh, RNA with this hypothetical protein attached with detergent. Same sort of thing you do when you're washing clothes to remove proteinaceous stains, you use a, a laundry detergent, so we threw in detergent, didn't affect the reaction at all. Well, that's very strange for the protein hypothesis. You know, it's an unusual protein that would be detergent resistant. Well, another thing that proteins don't like is being boiled. So we boiled the mixture and cooled it down again, and the splicing persisted. Again, not very supportive of the idea that there was a tightly attached uh, protein enzyme that was responsible for the splicing. Um, you can also kill proteins or inactivate them by adding uh, enzymes, other proteins that are good at degrading protein. Uh, the analogy would be uh, enzyme active laundry detergents that have an enzyme in them that helps metabolize a, a, a proteinaceous stain. And those also had no effect on the reaction. Well, uh, finally, uh, the evidence was so much in the, you know, it was so hard to prove the hypothesis that there was a tightly attached protein that we were really driven almost out of desperation to the opposite hypothesis that there perhaps is no protein associated. Perhaps the RNA by itself is capable of forming a catalytic active center to promote its own cutting and pasting reaction, its own RNA splicing reaction. So now, of course, you're subject to the possible criticism that, well, um, you haven't really, by all of this negative evidence, namely that the reaction is detergent insensitive, boiling insensitive, protease insensitive, maybe it's just a very exceptionally hearty protein, you know, that's attached. Maybe it's um, the world's most hard to inactivate protein enzyme. So how do you really go about proving the opposite? Well, we decided that if we would turn to a way of making the RNA where the RNA had never been exposed to a tetrahymena cell, would have no opportunity to 
uh, pick up a, a tightly adherent protein. Um, and then if that RNA could still undergo this splicing reaction, that would be as good a proof as, as we could think of that the activity was intrinsic to the RNA as opposed to being due to some uh, other uh, component that was contaminating the, the, the solution. And so we had to learn what at that time was a fairly new area, which was the recombinant DNA manipulations. We cloned a portion of the tetrahymen or ribosomal RNA gene uh, behind a promoter, which is a sequence that RNA polymerase sits down on and is a start site for making RNA. At the time, my wife was uh, working on research on E. coli RNA polymerase, so we had a familial source of, of the enzyme, mixed it together, made the RNA transcripts, and uh, purified away this one protein that we knew we had added, which was the E. coli RNA polymerase, uh, and then tested this uh, RNA for splicing. And in fact, it underwent cutting and rejoining at the same sites, and this was important, the same sites that were known to be the splice sites in vivo in the living organism. So this completely artificial reaction was now parroting what, ha what was happening in biology, and that uh, gave some uh, added uh, reason to believe that this, that this self-splicing reaction was of biological significance. We would have been quite happy to find that there was a, a protein involved. There was only one other laboratory in the world that was making much progress uh, purifying splicing enzymes. This was John Abelson's lab in Southern California. If we had been able to contribute to that, that would have been fine with us. We were lucky. It turned out there was something that was applauded much more generally in many different scientific fields that was waiting for us at the end of this, which was that RNA shares with protein the ability to catalyze biological reactions. So unknown to us when we <laughs> announced this discovery, there was a whole group of people out there who were just waiting for it. They sort of knew that this would come at some point if they would only live long enough. Uh, this was another generation of scientists from my own, so I was, uh, perhaps I should be embarrassed, I was quite unaware that there had been rampant speculation about RNA as a catalyst in the mid-1960s, when I was still in high school. And as I said, I was, if anything, interested in rocks and stars and chemistry at the time, so I wasn't paying any attention to this at all. But Francis Crick, Leslie Orgel, um, Carl Woese, Alex Rich, among others, had written articles speculating about this chicken and the egg problem. How, you know, if contemporary biology requires nucleic acids as the informational molecule to pass on information from generation to generation, but nucleic acids are inert, they can't do anything without proteins. Most importantly and most fundamentally, they can't be copied into a, a a, a reproduced copy without protein enzymes, then how do you get things started if you need both the nucleic acid and the protein, sort of both the information and the function, to have even the most primitive of self-replicating systems? Well, maybe RNA can do both things. And, and why would they think about RNA rather than DNA? Well, because the ribosome, which is one of the most fundamental machines in all of cells, contains a lot of ribonucleic acid. And, you know, maybe that's telling us something. Maybe the uh, primordial ribosome was, in fact, uh, um, the RNA doing the, the catalysis. So maybe RNA is the answer to the chicken and the egg. In other words, at the beginning, there was RNA replicating itself, catalyzing its own reproduction. And then the proteins came along later, and then finally the DNA, uh, an important afterthought, but sort of an afterthought uh, because we all know that even in modern uh, biology there are viruses uh, such as the common cold virus, the common flu virus, that have a genome made of RNA. And their central dogma is just RNA makes protein, RNA makes protein. You don't even need to necessarily mess with DNA if you're a, if you're a small genome. 
The word ribozyme came out of a laboratory contest that I held for a name. When we were writing up this cell paper, I thought we ought to have something to call it other than just the tetrahymena self-splicing intron. Why did I think that we should have a name for it? Well, because I thought that there would be additional examples. I liked the ribozyme one because it was much broader, and I had a hunch that the examples would be far beyond just the uh, self-splicing RNA. And in fact, they now have gone much beyond that because in this fascinating uh, area called test tube evolution or in vitro evolution, scientists have been able to use artificial test tube evolution techniques to, to identify ribozymes that have a whole panoply of, of catalytic activities, far beyond what the natural ones do, and those are now called ribozymes as well. The next one was about a year later, and it was a very important one. Uh, Sidney Altman from Yale University, with whom I shared the Nobel Prize, uh, working with uh, Norm Pace in a collaboration uh, on a, an enzyme called ribonuclease P that uh, was an unusual enzyme because it had a, an RNA component and, and a protein component. And the two together are, appear to be required for activity in the living cell. But they found that under conditions of elevated salt, in the test tube that the RNA by itself had the catalytic activity. It was a, a processing reaction that cut off a leader sequence off of transfer RNA precursors. So that was important because uh, it was a, a true multiple turnover enzyme. It met, met the whole definition of catalysis. It wasn't just a self-rearranging RNA, but it was an RNA that worked on other molecules, cutting them and releasing them and being unchanged in the process. Then within the next few years, many additional examples of self-splicing RNAs came to light, both ones that were structurally related to the tetrahymena example and ones that, were of, that established new structural and mechanistic categories. I remember um, one uh, researcher uh, from St. Louis uh, who was working on a yeast mitochondrial RNA, writing us very excitedly saying that uh, we repeated your experiments side by side with our own and it really does work, you know. And I, of course, he, he was very excited. I was slightly perturbed that he, you know, would even think that it might not work in his own hands, um, but he had gotten some materials from us as a positive control to run next to his own experiment and was able to reproduce our our, our findings. Uh, so uh, there was a, another group in um, Amsterdam that uh, found several examples of uh, RNA catalysts. There was a um, woman in uh, Albany, New York who, who found uh, bacterial examples. So it wasn't just in eukaryotes, organisms with a separate nucleus and cytoplasm, but also in, in bacteria. Uh, so it, it sort of, exp it, it spread exponentially, and now there are more than 1,500 different examples, sequenced examples of catalytic RNAs in the database.